if John Dryden were the major figure in the Restoration period and Alexander Pope the major figure in the first part of the 18th century, then Samuel Johnson is without question the major writer of the rest of the century. Johnson lived from 1709 to 1784. You see him on the chart there. And who were his contemporaries? In America, it was Benjamin Franklin, who lived almost the same length of time, from 1706 to 1790. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau in France from 1712 to 1778. I think it would be worthwhile at some point to offer a course in American, French, and English 18th century literature and use as the basic texts the works of these contemporaries, Johnson, Franklin, and Rousseau. You would perhaps have the intellectual basis for the modern Western world. Johnson was born in 1709 in Litchfield, the son of a bookseller. He felt offended as a youngster when his father asked him to take over his bookstall. But after his father's death, he apologized to his father by standing at the bookstall in the rain uh, as kind of a memorial. Now, if you're going to study Samuel Johnson, you're going to look to see what he has written in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, and in the 80s. That is, for almost a 50-year period, he was the major writer of the period. He went to Oxford College as a charity student. He did not have enough money to go, and he did not have enough money to complete his classes. And therefore, he only stayed there for 13 months. He then attempted to open up a school in Litchfield, and in 1735, married Elizabeth Porter. At the time, he was 26, and she was 20 years older than he and a widow. In 1737, he arrived in London writing for the Gentleman's Magazine, published by Edward Cave. Now, all of you have read, and studied, and reviewed the Gentleman's Magazine in our special collection room in the library. But one of his tasks was to report Parliament. And Parliament had decreed that none of its proceedings would be made public. So Johnson had friends of his smuggle notes of the parliamentary proceedings. And he developed a series of essays on the Parliament of Lilliput. He was reporting the adventures of Lilliput. Anytime you see the adventures of Lilliput, what you're doing is watching Gulliver's grandson viewing the political process of England through the guise of Lilliput. This was to avoid censorship. You had to circumvent and find some circumlocution for reporting events. The names of the various ministers were disguised in the adventures of Lilliput in the Gentleman's Magazine. And so you would have Wallalop, who would represent Walpole, and Haxalaf, who would represent Halifax. Now, because you had this obvious disguise and this obvious ruse, these politicians weren't about to identify themselves as people who were subject to ridicule. But years later, when Johnson was with some people and someone applauded a speech that had been given in Parliament and, re and published in the uh, newspapers, Johnson turned to the gentleman and said, thank you, I wrote that speech. Because what he did was, in effect, translate the notes into full-bodied uh, discourse and full-bodied information. In 1738, he wrote London a poem. And in 1744, he wrote an account of the life of Richard Savage. Savage was a writer who was heir to a great fortune, but his mother would not own him as her son. 
And so poor Savage lived a life of poverty, always trying to maintain his, uh, sustain and develop and prove his heritage. And Johnson wrote The Life of Savage. Now Johnson did something rather unique in this life. Prior to his writing of this life, most people when they wrote biographies would just cover historical events, the man's lifestyle, and mention what the person had written. Johnson developed a new style. He not only told the person's life history, but he looked at the works the person had written, evaluated them, and tried to put them in the context of historical perception. And this technique, the life of Richard Savage, was in fact to prove invaluable years later when he was asked to write the lives of the poets of the 17th-18th century. In 1749, he wrote The Vanity of Human Wishes, which is a major poem, and we're going to look at it in a few moments, analyze it, and see what he tells us in this remarkable poem, which is actually an imitation of Juvenal's tenth satire. In 1749, he wrote a poem called Irene. It wasn't a popular play. It wasn't even played but once, I believe. It dealt with a Moorish sultan who married a Christian woman by the name of Irene, brought her into his sultanate, to find that his advisors thought he was weak because he had forsaken his religion to marry someone out of it. And to prove that he had not weakened the sultan in front of all of his ministers took his sword and cut off her head. Well, a rather interesting play. He then began to publish his own magazine, The Rambler. It ran about 102 editions, and I believe he wrote all but 12 of them himself. We're going to look at some of the ideas and some of the essays in The Rambler. In 1752, his wife died, and he was alone. But he didn't like to live alone. He had a house on Guff Square, which is walking distance today of St. Paul's Cathedral. And he used to have numerous people live with him, among them a Dr. Levitt. And he's written an impressive poem about Dr. Levitt, who chose to minister amongst the poor. And if we have time today, we will look at this poem on the death of Dr. Levitt, even though it isn't in the text you're using. From 1753 to 1754, he published in another magazine that he started and developed called The Adventurer. So he was a journalist. Remember G.B. Harrison in a book called The Profession of English says that the best writers in the English language first were journalists because they learned to write fast, they learned to write accurately, and they learned to write to an audience. In 1755, Samuel Johnson published the dictionary. What he had done was to spend a number of years looking up all the words of the English language he could discover finding their etymolo etymological origins, and then citing passages from works that he thought uh, demonstrated the best usage of this language. So Johnson wrote the first prescriptive dictionary in the history of the English language. Now, what do I mean by prescriptive? Prior to Johnson, you had book lists. He had lists of words and what they essentially meant. But what Johnson was saying was that these words used by the best writers and the best authors and 
statesmen had certain levels of understanding. And so if you were going to write to a higher level, you would emulate these writers by using the language they use. This was the first prescriptive dictionary. Of course, words like eint would not be in the dictionary. It wasn't until Webster's New International Dictionary came out, probably in the late 50s, I believe, I'm not sure of the date at this point, that America sent 1,000 linguists around the country to find out how people actually spoke. And they found out that 90% of the educated people used the word ain't at one time or another. So ain't appeared in Webster's New International Dictionary. At the time, there were some booksellers who refused to sell it from on top of the counter. They would keep it hidden under the counter. But the difference was that Webster's International became a descriptive dictionary on how the language was spoken, and Johnson's was a prescriptive dictionary, and there's a difference there. In 1759, Johnson wrote the history of Rasselas, which we'll read at the next session. Rasselas is not a novel, although it consists of numerous episodes. It is not entirely a satire, although it has many satirical events in it. It is not a romance, even though marriage is a major topic of this work. And it is not a gothic novel, even though it describes death as exhibited by the pyramids. It is what is called an apologue, A-P-O-L-O-G-U-E. It consists of a series of sententious episodes intended to discover the truth of the world. And I think you'll enjoy reading it and reading about the act of flying, the real life of shepherds, and what marriage is all about. In 1762, he received a 300 pound pension from George III for having written the dictionary and for having been this celebrated person. And that was a munificent amount to honor a man distinguished who eventually received all right, uh, an honorary degree. In 1763, a monumental year, Johnson met a young man by the name of a young lawyer from Scotland by the name of James Boswell. Boswell was enamored of Johnson, spent a lot of time with Johnson, and uh, actually invited Johnson to take a tour through Scotland with him. And Boswell then became. Johnson's biographer. Everything that he knew about Johnson from experience, he would write down. And then when he was writing the life of Johnson later, he asked everyone whom he knew to send to him any correspondence or any information that Johnson had sent to them prior to their meeting in 1763. They met in Davy's bookshop. Johnson had a bias against Scotland, and Boswell, when he met Johnson, said, uh, Sir, I'm afraid I've just come from Scotland, as kind of a way of saying I'm, I'm only new and I haven't met anyone before. And Johnson's reply was that most people are afraid who come from Scotland and fearful of the life that they once lived there. Johnson did not like to be alone. He formed a club, and we're going to look at this club because it contained some of the most celebrated people in all of England, and we're going to look at this. It would be as though our major writers, our major poets, our major historians, our major philosophers, our major politicians met at one place a couple times a week. In 1765, Johnson wrote an edition of Shakespeare. And it's a formidable piece because he 
celebrates Shakespeare even while, while pointing out Shakespeare's faults. He considers Shakespeare to be a poet of nature and that incli- uh, who, who writes his own rules, and that makes him parallel to Homer. In 1765, Trinity College in Dublin gave him a Doctor of Laws degree. So we have Dr. Johnson, as he's often referred to. He met and became friendly with a brewer by the name of Henry Thrale and his wife, Hester. I mentioned to you that in 1773, uh, Boswell persuaded him to go to Scotland with him. We'll look at Boswell in a future session. But the uh, photographs, the Rowlandson photographs of Johnson are quite famous in Scotland. And some of the conversations that Johnson had with people in Scotland were interesting, including a man by the name of Lord Monboddo. Lord Monboddo advanced the idea that man came from primates. This was 100 years before Darwin. And so we, we, we see in the air uh, scientific and philosophical thought. Copyright had run out for a large number of poets by the end of the century, or toward the end of the century. And so the publishers, in order to renew their copyright, decided to come up with a multiple, a, a multi-volume edition of the works of the poets. And they asked Johnson to write introductions to each of these poets. Johnson's introduction to Alexander Pope ran 110 pages. But a study of Johnson's writing about any of these poets is significant. And it's from 1779 to 81, he became the major critical voice of poetry for the past 200 years. In 1784, he died, is buried near Chaucer and Spencer. Now, let's look at some of these works that we ought to spend time for it. But first, let me mention the club. The club was founded in the winter of 1763 by Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was in charge of the uh, Royal Academy of Arts. Election to, to membership was like election to parliament. People wanted to be members of it. By 1773, there were 16 members. By 1784, 35 members. And they used to meet in a restaurant called the Cheser Cheese, which is uh, just in the same courtyard as the uh, as J- Johnson's home. I had dinner at the Cheser Cheese, and one year we had a convention in Houston, and I said we wanted to replicate this deer, deer meat pudding, this deer meat stew, and the apple pie and the wine of old England. So we went to the old Shamrock Hotel and told them what the menu was at the Cheser Cheese, and we wanted to replicate it. We were going to, at that time, charge all the people coming to the conference $25 each. Three days before the conference, we were told by the chef they couldn't get venison, so they're going to substitute chicken. Second, they couldn't get apple pie from England, so they're going to make apple pie from one of the local bakeries. And they couldn't get port. They didn't order the port wine in time, so they were going to serve domestic wine. It was a total disaster. I think I was one of the few people in Houston who was pleased to see the Shamrock Hotel torn down. But if you go to London, you are served family style at the Cheshire Cheese restaurant, and you can uh, you sit at a table with a number of other people. It's near Fleet Street. You'll meet journalists and others, and you will get a taste of England. They used to meet weekly on Mondays for supper, and among the members of this group, now remember, there are many people intimidated by great people. <laughs> 
there are many people who would hesitate to sit at tables because they wouldn't know how to, what to say or what to talk or how to carry on a conversation. Johnson was a great conversationalist. Among the people in this club, Topham Beauclark, the great grandchild of Charles II and Nell Gwynn, who was the actress. Uh, Garrick, David Garrick, the famous actor, didn't care for them too much, didn't care for Topham Beauclark. James Boswell became a member of the club. Boswell had become famous, and we'll talk about that, because he visited the, the uh, uh, insurrectionists in Goa, who were try in Corsica, who were trying to separate themselves from uh, the Portuguese. Charles Burney, a music historian. Edmund Burke, the politician. Charles Burney, a music historian. Edmund Burke, who sided with America in the American Revolution and who opposed the French Revolution and who's written a very important philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, and he has emulated the uh, Perry Hupsos. Andrew Shamir was a businessman, a secretary of the war office, secretary of state. David Garrick, the leading actor of the time, whom Johnson greatly admired, uh, Johnson probably would have written a much better edition of Shakespeare if he had paid attention to Garrick. Garrick had the best collection of first folios, quartos of Shakespeare in England. And he invited Johnson, when he knew Johnson was working on the, on the Shakespeare edition, to use his books. But Johnson was a rather large man. He was rather clumsy in his behavior. He, he didn't care about little things. He was sloppy in the way he ate, and uh, Garrick was concerned about his books. So he told Johnson that you could come to my apartment, I'll have a candle for you, and I will set out a meal for you, and you may use my books in my apartment. Well, Johnson realized that Garrick was insulting him, telling him that he was a sloppy eater and he was going to abuse his books. I mean, Johnson would just as likely look at the good book, read what was in it, or a rare book, read what, what was in it, and thrown it in the corner when he was through with it. So a, uh, he refused to use David Garrick's collection. He would have had a better edition. Edward Gibbon, who wrote The History of the Decline of the Roman Empire, one of the great sardonic books of all time, he, is, he attacks human nature and he attacks the corruption of religion in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, the history of the decline of the Roman Empire. Oliver Goldsmith. Goldsmith wrote an important novel, an important play, and an important poem. He wrote The Deserted Village, an important poem. He wrote one of the most famous plays of the 18th century, She Stoops to Conquer. And he wrote a novel called The Vicar of Wakefield, which was one of the most widely read novels of the time. Sir John Hawkins was his legal ex executor. He edited the first collection of Johnson's works, and he wrote Johnson's biography. Sir William Jones, an Orientalist. We have five volumes of Sir William Jones's books in our rare book library. On the right hand, you have the English. On the left hand, you have Farsi. If any of you knows Farsi, you can translate William Jones and have yourself an interesting uh, thesis and dissertation. Bennett Langton, a Greek scholar, Burke's father-in-law, a physician. Thomas Percy, who wrote, who compiled all the ballads of England first and wrote a book called The Relics of Ancient English Poetry. And Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was a co-founder of the Royal Academy, was a member of this club. It also included William Brinsley Sheridan, who wrote The Rivals and The School for Scandal, and Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations. What's interesting about where Adam Smith is, Adam Smith says, a nation has four priorities. 
defense, education, civil works, and the justice system. Which do you think is the first priority of a nation, of those four? Defense, the justice system, the education, or civil works? All right, you have to press the button so we can hear your opinion. Mr. Tate. Mr. Taft. Mr. Taft. Defense. Defense, right. No matter how much money we spend today in defense, they spent an equal amount of time, uh, amount in the 18th century. You can't be a nation unless you can defend yourselves, right? As Kuwait learned uh, in the first Iraqi war. Uh, so all the money we spend on defense, people may complain about it, but it is Adam Smith's assertion, this is our first priority. The priority has never changed. What is next? Education, civil works, or the justice system? I need a quick response. Mr. Dickerson. I'd say the justice system. All right. How many of you agree? Raise your hand if you agree that the justice system is the second most important priority. We have a resounding response in your behalf. And uh, that's true. If you can't trust the justice system, if you don't think you can go to court and get a fair treatment, then, of course, you have no government. Now, education and civil works, which is the top priority? Ms. Few? Ms. Few here? You thinking? What would you say is the next priority? Education or civil works? Education. That's because you're at the University of Houston and you think it should be a priority. But the truth of the matter is that no mayor can get elected unless the potholes are filled. No government can run if the phones aren't working and no city will maintain itself if there's no electricity on time. So the civil works are primary, and they still and still is a third priority, and education is always the fourth priority. Adam Smith laid it out in in his uh, book in 1776, and the idea exists even today. Yes, Dr. Ninnis. Well, isn't that a question of uh, urgency taking precedence over importance? <laughs> well, it depends. If you're a, uh, in a foreign country and you, don't have, and you have electricity only three hours a day, then you, uh, you're not an industrial nation anymore. So what is important, of course, is uh, the priority for most people, as far as the government is concerned. If you have education, then most of the others will also be taken care of, but it's not obvious. Only a few people need education to keep the rest happy, right? Let's move on. Uh, Thomas Wharton is a major writer and wrote Observations on the Fairy Queen. Now, Johnson didn't like John Wilkes. John Wilkes uh, defended the Americans during the uh, Revolutionary War. And uh, John Wilkes was a liberal a, a considerable liberal. In fact, they hated him in Parliament. Sir Francis Dashwood, the head of Parliament, once approached John Wilkes in Parliament and was declaiming against him. By the way, the word pox in, in, in the language means venereal disease. And Dashwood looked at John Wilkes and said, I don't know, sir, whether you will die by hanging or by the pox. And Wilkes' reply was, that depends, sir, on whether I embrace your principles or your mistress. <laughs> Boswell approached Johnson once and said, uh, you know, would you be inclined to invite anyone to the club? Anyone to dine with you? And Bo Johnson, of course, who admitted no, uh, no bias, said, yes, of course, I'll have anyone come and join with me and we'll have a good meal. Boswell invited John Wilkes, which was a shocker. 
and he was waiting for the fur to fly and the fight to take place. But Boswell, but Johnson and Wilkes actually got along quite well together. Disappointing Boswell, I suppose. And anyway, that's the club. And you can see it's a very f exciting intellectual milieu that we find ourselves in. Now, I want to look now at Johnson's Vanity of Human Wishes. This poem uh, is found in your text. In the, sec in, the first in the second edition, it's on page 643. And uh, it is an imitation of the tenth satire of Juvenal. Now, what do we mean by an imitation? You can take a Latin translation and you can translate it literally, in which case you would have uh, a word for word or phrase by phrase translation. Or you can paraphrase, you can summarize essentially what the Ju juvenile says. Or you can imitate. Imitation says that you substitute for juvenile's time events of your time that can exhibit the same traits that juvenile is trying to describe. So we're on page 643 in the second edition. Now I want to run through, first of all, the ideas in juvenile, the Latin poet, so you can see at this point what the basic themes are that we're reading. Now remember, most of the people who are educated, the 12,000 educated people who read this poetry in the 18th century, all went to school, they all studied Latin, they know what Juvenal had written. And so the interesting event is for them to see how Juvenal is transformed by the writer into a contemporary work. Juvenal says, few in this world know what is really good for them. To one person, eloquence is fatal, to another, strength. To Seneca, his wealth. To the latter, neither the Laterini, their palace. Next, all pray for what eventually ruins them. Democritus, le Democritus leaps, uh, Democritus laughs, and Heraclitus weeps at such follies. So, if you're uh, familiar with the, the democracy, the idea of a populist own government, if you're familiar with games theory, you understand what Juvenal is saying. Oops. Democritus would have laughed to see the praetor attend the games in pomp and splendor. He's supposed to be a man of the people, and here he is dressed in these great clothes. Some are ruined because others envy their power. Sejanus is one. One moment they're, our, they're, they're idle, the next the victim. Now Sejanus was an aide second to the emperor. In Johnson's poem, Sejanus becomes Wolsey, and instead the emperor, his indebtedness is to Henry VIII. And we'll see how, how this works in this poem. Johnson makes these transformations. Would you be like Sejanus? Would you choose his power and accept his fate? Would you want strength, power, and then find yourself divested of authority? Or would you rather be a country magistrate, straight, unknown but living in safety? Remember Crassus and Pompey. Remember that few tyrants die without being bloodied. 20th century concept. He talks about boys who go to school. What do you study? Boys at school long to be like Demosthenes or Cicero. Their rhetoric proved fatal to both. It's safer to have written bad poetry than the second Philippic. Otherwise, you get enemies or you get people who are your rivals and you find that you have enemies when you begin to write critical poetry against the government. 
Let's look at what happens with power. Weigh the ashes of Hannibal. Little remains of this man who had such a glorious career and so ignominious an end. Now, in the vanity of human wishes, we're going to see that the warrior who comes to the end is Charles XII of Sweden, the first Hitler of the world in Europe. Charles XII combated Peter the Great. We'll look at that in just a few moments in Johnson's poem. He says, we don't really know. Remember, this is the vanity of human wishes. What is it people want? And when they get what they want, what does their vanity then destroy? Mothers, says Juvenile, again, pray for their children to be beautiful. But beauty endangered Lucretia and Virginia. Beauty and modesty rarely join in the same person. Your handsome son has many dangers in his path. So while he may be handsome, he may also be the target of people who are jealous or people who want to take advantage of him. All right, that essentially are, those are some of the points you find in Juvenile. Now let's see what Johnson says. He begins by saying, he begins with an important line. Let observation with extensive view survey mankind from China to Peru. This again is an iambic couplets. And what he's doing is really crossing the breadth of the Roman Empire. Let us remark each anxious toil, each eager strife, and watch the busy scenes of crowded life. So the first 20 lines talk about how rarely reason guides our opinions, our actions. We'd like to think people are reasonable, but it's not going to happen. People will fall in the general massacre of gold. Looking for wealth, looking for lucre, they will die, collapse, find themselves impoverished. What do people fear? What is the statesman's fear or care? the insidious arrival, and the gaping air. If you become famous and you are a statesman, there will be others trying to put you out of office. And then, of course, there will be your sons or your daughters or your nephews or your nieces who will hope for your inheritance. That's what you mean to them. He says in lines 49 to 68 that we're not, we don't share government anymore. He says, once more, Democritus, arise on earth. Now go to line 99, because what we're going to do there is discuss the Sejanus episode that we saw in Juvenile. Here we have Thomas Wolsey, Lord Chancellor under Henry VIII, Remember, Henry VIII split away from the Church of Rome and established the Anglican Episcopal Church. And this led to the divisiveness which, for two centuries then, led France and Spain to try to reinstate on the English throne a Roman Catholic ruler. Woolsey is strong. Woolsey is powerful. Woolsey may be an assistant to the President of the United States. But here he is, loyal to Henry VIII. Now let's look at the sonority, the sound, the rhythms of Johnson's attack upon pride. In full-blown dignity, we see Woolsey stand Law in his voice and fortune in his hand. So he's in charge. 
to him the church, the realm, their powers consign. Through him the rays of regal bounty shine. You're going to earn your keep. You're going to get, you can't get to Henry VIII except through Wolsey. Turned by his nod, the stream of honor flows. His smile alone security bestows. Once he sheds his favor upon someone, that person is going to share his benefits. His sm Still to new heights, his restless wishes tower. Claim leads to claim, and power advances power. He's never satisfied with the power he has. He keeps insinuating himself more boldly into Henry VIII's administration. Till conquest, unresisted, ceased to please, and rights submitted left him none to seize. He had reached the top of his rank, but then he fell out of favor. Wolsey opposed the separation from the Church of Rome. He was forced out of office, and he ended his life as a mendicant monk by himself. And any time you buy yourself an English life, you're isolated, it is an anathema. It is not, the convent life is not recommended and is not a mark of respect in English life. At length the sovereign frowns, the train of state mark the keen glance and watch the sign to hate. All these people who have been before submissive to Wolsey, now they see he's in a favor, he's out of favor. They now know they can turn against him. At length his sovereign frowns, the train of state mark the keen glance and watch the sign to hate. Where'er he turns, he meets a stranger's eye. His suppliants scorn him and his followers fly. Now drops at once the pride of awful state, the golden canopy, the glittering plate. He sits under a throne. There's a golden canopy. Canopy. What is the glittering plate? Miss Luck. Miss Luck here. Okay. Uh, what is the glittering Miss Weston? Glittery, glittering plate. Anyone? What does he mean by the glittering plate? Some of us eat on fine china. Some people eat on gold plates. When Richard Nixon came into the White House, one donor donated more than $125,000 to develop new plates that had Nixon's seal on them for the White House. Glittering plate. No longer does Woolsey have this. Now drops at once the pride of awful state, the golden canopy, the glittering plate, the regal palace, the luxurious board, the liveried army, and the menial lord. You don't have an army to stand by you, to fight for you, you don't even have people who will pay obeisance to you because you are now out of favor with the king. You can find all kinds of situations of people today in the government who are out of favor today because they've written books explicating what happened in the government and where they once held positions of status, they are now attacked by people of status. With age, with cares, with maladies oppressed, he, that's Wolsey, seeks the refuge of monastic rest. Grief, AIDS disease, remembered folly stings, and his last sighs reproach the faith of kings. When Wolsey died, he's said to have said he would have died happier had he paid greater debt to God than to his king. So here you have an episode from Juvenal translated into 
this imitation of the tenth satire where people change. Let's look at another which deals with Charles the Twelfth. This is a powerful, powerful design. Turn to line 190. Charles XII of Sweden was the most powerful ruler in England, rivaling even Peter the Great. Charles conquered nations around him. He forced kings to abdicate. Nothing would stand in his way but his military might. And then he decided to attack Russia. And he went into Russia, and the Russians engaged in their Cold War strategy where they kept pulling back until Charles' troops were so strung out and had so little to eat that the battle weary uh, fled back to Europe. Charles had been defeated by the Russians. He was the first in the 18th century. Napoleon in the second century in the next century, 19th century, went into Russia. He was defeated. And Hitler in the 20th century went into Russia and was defeated the same way. But Charles is the first. We don't know how Charles died, but one of the suggestions was that his own men may have killed him in a small battle in a small area. Let me, let's read this passage about Charles XII. Again, it's a, the defeat of pride and the attack on pride. On what foundation stands the warrior's pride? How just his hopes let Swedish Charles decide. A frame of adamant, a soul of fire. No dangers fright him and no labors tire. Look at that icicle and that balance. No dangers fright him and no labors tire. He keeps moving his armies forward. Or love or force extends his wide domain, unconquered lord of pleasure and of pain. He controls people's lives. He controls the lives of the nations around him. No joys to him pacific scepters yield. He was not going to join into peace uh, uh, concessions or, or accept peace concessions. No joys to him, Pacific inceptors yield. War sounds the trump. He rushes to the field. Behold, surrounding kings, their power combine, and one capitulate, and one resign. Again, the balance. No matter what he does, he's conquering. And these kings submit to him. Whether they're defeated in battle or whether they submit peacefully. Peace courts his hand, but spreads her charms in vain. Think nothing gained, he cries, till not remain. On Moscow's walls till Gothic standards fly, and all is mine beneath the polar sky. So now he's going to march toward Russia. On, he's going to place the Gothic banner the banner of the Germanic Swedish nation on the battlefields and the cities of Russia. The march begins in military state. Notice the alliteration. The march begins in military state. And nations on his eye suspended wait. Where is he going to move? Now, Johnson switches suddenly to his defeat. And he starts by saying, Stern famine guards the solitary coast, and winter barricades the realms of frost. He comes. Doesn't matter. The winter's there. Charles ignores it. He thinks he can handle the Russian winter. <coughs> he comes, nor want nor cold his course delay. He's defeated at the Battle of Poltawa. And Johnson needs no more. This compression. He's not going to give us the battle. He's not going to give us the fight. He's going to give us the aftermath. <laughs>
Hide blushing glory. Hide Poltera's day. The vanquished hero, that's Charles XII, leaves his broken bands and shows his miseries in distant lands. Now he wants to raise armies so that he can reinstate his power. And Johnson becomes ironic here. He is condemned, a needy supplicant to wait, while ladies interpose and slaves debate. No one's paying attention to Charles now when he goes to foreign courts and wants them to form alliances so that he can strengthen his army again. Question. How did he die? And um, the, the, the note tells you that at the siege of Fredrikshold in Norway, he was killed. Here's what happens. Did no subverted empire mark his end? Did rival monarchs give the final wound? Or hostile millions press him to the ground? His fall was destined to a barren strand, a petty fortress, and a dubious hand. Was he fragged? Did his own men shoot him? That's always a question. How did he die? He left the name in which the world grew pale to point a moral or adorn a tale. Well, what you have there is balance. Strength from the use of strong rhetorical trope. Powerful, balanced statements. Rhymes that give you your themes. State and weight. Coast and frost rhyme. You're going to have a delay and then the day is going to come to an end. You're going to find broken bands and distant lands. The rhymes are thematic. You can almost look at the rhymes and determine the themes in this particular work. T.S. Eliot said that the vanity of human wishes is one of the greatest poems ever written. Because nothing has been ever written, and nothing has been written like it since. Now, we've had a lot of wars since. <clears throat> we've had poetry coming out of the Vietnamese War. We're likely to have poet com poetry coming out of this war. Um, but who's going to write a poem that exp explains both the actions of the war, the meaningful events of the war, and the moral circumstances of the war the way Samuel Johnson has done it? We do need people like that. We do need writers who will take up this movement. Let's look for a few moments at the journalism of the period. <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> you all should write for the Daily Cougar. It's the only newspaper on this campus that allows you to discover facts and express your own opinion. It's a monumental task bringing out a newspaper five days a week, and I think that the, uh, the opportunity to express oneself and to do it quickly and to do it well is, a, uh, is, is very important. Johnson wrote The Rambler from 1750 to 52. He participated in The Adventure from 1753 to 54, and he wrote The Idler from 1758 to 60. If you're still looking for a research topic, Johnson's journalism would be a fairly good choice. His major themes are the love of London, the differences between personal liberty, which he celebrates, and political liberty, which he fe feels is often truncated. <clears throat> 
he writes about the contempt for parental authority. He admires realistic writing. He distrusts rules of literature. And when he celebrates the literature of Shakespeare, he is demonstrating that Shakespeare creates his own rules. We don't have to follow Shakespeare so often. And we, we, Shakespeare doesn't have to follow the rules that most writers follow. One assumption is that the public gives you your test of literature. If the public likes the literature and buys it and publishes it and reads it, then there must be success. Or there is a test of a measure of success. Now we're talking about any kind of book and uh, we're talking about novels, we're talking about poetry. Let's look at some of the ideas that he has expressed in his poetry. <clears throat> November 4th, Saturday, March 31, 1750. He discusses Horace's Ars Poetica, which is the art of poetry. We saw Alexander Pope's essay on criticism that was an imitation of Ars Poetica. He talks about the practical content of modern fiction and the necessity of imitating nature, as Homer did. But that's human nature, by the way. You understand how people act and how people react. Tuesday, April 3rd, 1750. How do people search for happiness? Men who delight in cards, tavern dinner, gossip. That's what we like. We like people who like to be with each other. But men who cannot bear their own company are disturbed, says Johnson. You've got to want to be with other people. Number 25, he deals with the importance of genius and industry. Number 50, reproaches of old age and youth. Number 59 deals with superstition. Number 117, the aspirations of writers who live in garrets and are impoverished and have to make a living. Number 134, the difficulty of a writer getting to his task. Why do we procrastinate when we want to write papers? Number 144, what are the hazards of aspiration? Climbing in business or politics. If you want to go up higher, what dangers do you discover? Number 148 is an essay against parental authority. Sometimes the parents are too strict. I think Johnson felt his father at one point was too strict. He talks about cruelty toward children and the need for compassion. Number 154 is in defense of learning and the need for reading. I think people are now saying the children ought not be watching television as much as they are watching it, uh, among other reasons, because there's no censorship anymore, among other because television scripts are written to a third grade audience, and there's a third, people who with a third grade reading capability. You don't want to use big words, you'll turn people off. And he talks about John Locke's defense of knowledge against superstition. Knowledge prevents you from superstition. Number 155, the difficulty a man has in recognizing his own faults. Number 204 is almost an episode of people arriving at great at high status. Seged, Lord to the Seged is in his 27th year as a monarch of 40 nations, his life and his fate. So what you have are a lot of essays variegated in nature, a journalist trying to entertain his audience, inform his audience, educate his audience, and keep his audience. You've got to want to keep your audience. 
We have a writer who writes for the Daily Cougar, Mr. Lutz, I believe, who writes about squirrels all the time. Every time he translates a serious problem, he translates it into an affair where squirrels can talk with him or squirrels can inspire him. And so he has a reading audience. People want to know what the squirrels on campus are doing next. Last, what I want to do is talk about the lives of the poets. A publisher's cartel wished to sustain copyright thrown out four years earlier by the courts. And they chose to publish the works of a large number of writers. Johnson was asked to write the prefaces in 1779, he produced two volumes of prefaces for 22 authors. One volume had essays on but two authors alone. In 1781, he produced another six volumes with 30 lives in which he discussed 30 poets. He was paid 210 pounds. Remember, he gets 300 pounds a year from, from uh, the King of England. It was raised to 315 pounds, and then when he revised the text in 1783, the year before his death, he uh, earned another 100 pounds. That's a lot of money. That's 200, 1,600 times uh, 1,600 times, let's see, 200, 1,600 times 10, about $16,000. Here are some of the people whom he writes about. See how many you know. Savage, Waller, Denham, Milton, Butler, Rochester, Roscommon, Otway, Pomfret, Doris, Stepney, John Phillips, Walsh, Dryden, Smith, Duke, King, Spratt, Halifax, Parnell. Here you are, juniors and seniors. You're going to have to stay here another two years in order to read all these poets. Garth, Raoul, Addison, Hughes, Sheffield, Pryor, Congreve, the playwright, Blackmore, Fenton, Gay, Granville, Yalden, Tickle, Hammond, Somerville, Swift, Watts, Ambrose Phillips, Young, Pope, Pitt, Thompson, David Mallet, well, what we're going to do is look at a few of them and see what Johnson thought about them. I told you that he's very imaginative. He not only tells you what these writers do, but he evaluates what they're going to be saying. Now, he's not always right. For example, Lycidas, which is one of the great elegies, pastoral elegies of all time, that Milton wrote to Edward King, Johnson didn't like it at all. And he's wrong about this. One of the poems on which much praise has been bestowed is Lycidas. This is Johnson's comments. Of which the diction is harsh, the rhymes uncertain, and the numbers unpleasing. In this poem there is no nature, for there is no truth. There is no art, for there is nothing new. Its form is that of a pastoral, easy, vulgar, and therefore disgusting. Why don't you write vigorous criticism like that? Just tell me what you think about this poetry you're looking at. Rotham will say, you should be more judicious. He liked Paradise Lost, even though it had some problems. He says, of the probable and the marvelous, two parts of a vulgar now, vulgar means dealing with the people. A vulgar epic poem which emerged the critic in deep consideration. The paradise lost requires little to be said. It contains the history of a miracle, of creation and redemption. Johnson was a pious Christian. Uh, 
it displays the power and the mercy of the Supreme Being. The probable, therefore, is marvelous, and the marvelous is probable. The substance of the narrative is truth, and as truth allows no choice, it is, like necessity, superior to rule. Now he talks about how Milton dressed up the, this work. To the accidental or adventitious parts, as to everything human, some slight exceptions may be made. We may not like what how, how, how a, uh, Milton humanizes Christ or the angels. Some slight exceptions may be made, but the main fabric is immovably supported. He liked Paradise Lost. How about sin and death, the allegory? Remember, Satan has created sin out of his brain, and then he has had intercourse with sin to produce death. So you've got incest, and in order to get out of paradise, Satan persuades death, who's always hungry, that he's going to give him something to eat all the time. And so he brings death into the world so that death can fulfill its voracious appetite with people dying. And this becomes part of Paradise Lost. What does Johnson say? Milton's allegory of sin and death is undoubtedly faulty. Sin is indeed the mother of death, and may be allowed to be the portress of hell. But when they, start, when they stop the journey of Satan, a journey described as real, and when death offers him battle, the allegory is broken. That sin and death should have shown the way to hell might have been allowed. But they cannot facilitate the passage by building a bridge because the difficulty of Satan's passage is described as real and sensible, and the bridge ought to be only figurative. So you can't have a bridge from hell to earth because it's physical. And the trip is only allegorical. All right, let's move on. Abraham Cully. Johnson did not like metaphysical poetry. He destroyed it in the minds of people. He destroyed it in the minds of people for 100 years until T.S. Eliot revised it. Okay. Bring it up in just a minute. He says... What's, what, what do the metaphysical poets do? You've got them using a flea to describe the Trinity, for example. He says, this is not witty for him. He says, when you take odd objects and bring them together and make a clever comparison, it's bad. Of wit thus defined, they have more than enough. The most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together. Now that's biblical. You're not allowed to put an ox and a horse under the same yoke because the ox will kill the horse. You can't put a taller animal in the yoke with a smaller animal. The smaller animal will die. So by taking these odd images and yoking them together, Johnson says, is bad policy. T.S. Eliot revived the metaphysical poets in his essay on poets in the 20th, early 20th century. But for until T.S. Eliot, Johnson's view prevailed. <clears throat> he compares Pope and Dry Dryden Pope. Listen to what he says. Of genius, that power which constitutes a poet, that quality without which judgment is cold and knowledge is inert, that energy which co collects, combines, amplifies, and animates, the superiority must with some hesitation be allowed to Dryden. It is not to be inferred that of this poetical vigor, Pope had only a little, because Dryden had more. For every other writer since Milton must give place to Pope. And even of Dryden, it must be said, 
That he, if he has brighter paragraphs, he has not better poems. Dryden's performances. Dryden's performances were always hasty, either excited by some external occasion or extorted by domestic necessity. He composed without consideration and published without correction. What his mind could supply and call or gather in one excursion was all that he sought and all that he gave. Then he goes on. The dilatory caution of Pope enabled him to condense his sentiments, to multiply his images, and to accumulate all that study might produce or chance might supply. If the flights of Dryden therefore are higher, Pope continues longer on the wing. If of Dryden's fire the blaze is brighter, of Pope the heat is more regular and constant. What does he say about Pope's essay on criticism? One of the greatest, though of his earliest works, is the essay on criticism, which if he had written nothing else, would have placed him among the first critics and the first poets, as it exhibits every mode of excellence that can embellish or dignify didactic composition, selection of matter, novelty of arrangement, justness of precept, splendor of illustration, and propriety of digression. He liked the rape of the lock. He disliked Swift. I'm not he said the tail of the tub was a dangerous work. It attacked religion. The battle of the books, he said, was plagiarized, but he had nevertheless admired Swift's energy and style. He thought the argument against abolishing Christianity was a happy and judicious irony. Because, of course, a, um, Swift did not intend to abolish Christianity. For him, Christianity only meant the Anglican Church. He thought the others were insinuating themselves against the Church. But of Gulliver's Travels, he says, he generally admired Gulliver's Travels, but the third part gives the reader least pleasure, that's the essay on science, and the last gives the reader most disgust. That's the Yahoo's throwing excrement on Gulliver and others. What does he say about Thomas Gray? Remember the elegy in the country churchyard? Listen to this statement. Now remember, here you have a man taking 50 or more poets, assessing them for almost 100 pages each delineating not only their personalities, but their works, passing a judgment that would last for hundreds of years, giving us critical judgment that few can supersede. What does he say about the elegy on the country churchyard? In the character of his elegy, I rejoice to concur with a common reader, for by the common sense of readers, uncorrupted with literary prejudices, after all the refinements of subtlety and the dogmatism of learning, must be finally decided all claim to poetical honors. The churchyard abounds with images. The churchyard abounds with images which find a mirror in every mind and with sentiments to which every bosom returns an echo. The four stanzas beginning, yet even these bones are to me original. I have never seen the notions in any other place. Yet he that reads them here persuades himself that he's always felt them. Had Gray written often thus, it had been vain to blame and useless to praise him. Now, when you begin studying, begin looking at Samuel Johnson. You're looking at a man who, in the 30s, produced outstanding journalistic e uh, essays. In the 40s, produced brilliant satire. In the 50s, produced a dictionary. In the 60s, produced 
his Shakespeare. In the 70s, he wrote his journey to the Western Islands where he describes life in Scotland. And in the late 70s and 80s, gives us the lives of the poets. What can you say about a man whose career spends 50 years? Arnold Palmer is playing his 50th Masters Tournament this year. Some can emulate Johnson. None can imitate him. <laughs>